Uh, good evening. Yeah, so I'm Ollie Beckett. So I'm the uh, the fund manager on the European Smaller Companies Trust. So I'm, I'm going to go through this evening. I'm going to share a presentation with you, sort of talk a little bit about the trust and why I think European smaller companies might be interesting. Um, and then I'll happily take some questions at the end and I'll well, I'll give you an honest answer. I'll try and answer it anyway. Okay. Um, so let me just, just see if I can share this presentation. Okay, maybe let's just start here. Actually, you can't even see the end of this graph, which is a little bit annoying probably because of the pictures of us, but you're just going to have to believe me, okay? Look, over time, and if we go back to the year 2000, European smaller companies would have delivered you a return of 558%. If, that was, if we were to look at large cap, that figure would be 143%. And actually, European smaller companies would have even outperformed the beloved US large cap. So over time, this has been the place to be. Why? Because this is where the growth is. This is smaller companies getting bigger. Now, the last three years are somewhat of an anomaly uh, in the European large cap has outperformed small cap. That's partly because look, we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has drove up energy prices and therefore oil prices, which is good. Obviously, most of those large cap companies are, you know, large oil companies are large cap. And similarly, with inflation picking up and bond yields picking up, banks and financials have done very well, which again, tend to be in that large cap space. So that's, that's why they outperformed. But it's, a, it's an anomaly, as I say. Um, in terms of this trust, the gross assets are, well, about 800 million. Um, the other thing I'd say, over time, we've managed to invest in companies generating cash. And we've had that progressive dividend. I'm not telling you to invest in this fund for income particularly, but you know we've got a yield of about 2.5%. Um, the discount currently, I'll come back to it, is at 15%. So it's going cheap, if you like. Um, and gearing at the moment, where well, it actually says 13% on their screen, but that was at the end of September. Today, we're just under 15%. We are pretty much geared to the max that I've agreed with the board. Why? Because this space is looking really interesting post the sort of capitulation again that we saw in September and October. Uh, and these companies are sort of almost priced for a recession, which I don't think is inevitable. Uh, look, this is a morning star chart. All it's telling you, okay, we're the, we're the blue circle and the, the major other investment trust in the European small mid-cap space are the, are the other lovely little shapes. What this is saying is what, what's different about us? We are a true small cap fund. We go down the market cap range. We're not just investing in mid-cap. Why do we do that? We think there are opportunities there. Uh, it's under research and actually valuations at that low end of the market are looking really exciting at the moment. So we're, we're always at a slightly lower average market cap. And then the other thing I'd say that's slightly different about us, we always care about valuation. Okay, valuation matters to us. The price you pay for an equity matters, just as a price you pay for a car or a TV matters. Um, and we think that will matter for a long time going forward because we feel the period of free money is over a period that we've had since the global financial crisis, where we've uh, people have required, you know, we've had very low um, interest rates. We think that's gone. Uh, yes, I expect inflation to come down and I expect interest rates to come down, but I do not expect it to disappear. So valuation, I think, will be way more important in the next 10 years than it has been in the last 10. This, I don't know if you can see this chart, but it, it, the other slight difference with ourselves is that we will invest in companies across their sort of economic life cycle, if you like. Because we go down the market cap range, we will invest in companies that are quite early cycle, sort of small cap, micro caps. Like everyone else, we'll try and get those sort of small cap quality growth names. Uh, we, will invest in, we will invest in mature companies if the valuation is attractive. Because in 20, 21, 22, during COVID, et cetera, everyone ran away from these sort of companies throwing off cash. You know, Amarin, for example, is the largest cork manufacturer in the world, you know, predominantly for wine. Uh, you may say not that exciting, but it's a great little company just throwing off cash. 
Um, and these are the sort of things we, we will look at, not just the sort of maybe some of the predictable tech growth companies. And then another space that we play in maybe more than others is turnaround companies, companies that maybe actually fallen on tough times, but there's an inflection point, there's a new management team, there's a change in this sort of economic environment. Fugro used to do sort of seismic surveys of the seabed predominantly for um, the oil industry. But over time, you know, new management's come in, they've repaired the balance sheet, and they've had a tailwind from this whole growth in offshore wind as they sort of do the seismic surveys for the sort of the renewable space. So again, we will invest in a lot of these renewables, a lot of these recovery companies, companies that historically have had low returns, but now have improving returns. Why might it be interesting to look at European smaller companies now? Look, maybe contrary to your opinion or thoughts, European smaller cap is geared to global growth. This is why, in a way, it's been out of favor. People have been worried about the, sort of the economic slowdown. But if the economy stabilizes and if there isn't a hard landing in the economy, uh, this will be the place to be. Now, this is looking at something called the Purchasing Managers Index, i.e. Uh, management team's intention to invest, if you like. And there's historically been a high correlation with European smaller companies outperforming. The situation here is almost it's been so bad, you would expect it to get better very soon. Um, and we've started to see that improvement in Germany. OK, so this. You know, I, I think we're at a trough. I personally don't think we're going to see a hard landing. What would a hard landing mean? I guess mass unemployment. I think. That is unlikely but for demographic reasons alone in Europe. So again, this looks like an interesting time to get involved. Other things maybe to look at, you know, just take one market that we look at, which is Sweden, which has had a tough time. I and mean, we've seen house prices fall further in Sweden than probably anywhere else in Europe. It had a great little boom and it's had a little bust. And that's exemplified by the housing market in Sweden. We're starting to see a pickup in orders for the Swedish industrials. Sweden is probably the most open economy within continental Europe. So again, there are sort of glimmers of hope there um, that we're through the sort of destocking that we've seen across Europe. So again, that is a positive. Uh, this is stating the obvious, but again, this should be a catalyst for maybe, and we're starting to see it in the last 10 days or so, Inflation, I think it has peaked, okay? Um, there are signs it is now coming down. As I say, we're not in the cap that expects it to disappear. I think it probably settles at 3 4%. And people also get used to interest rates at 3 4%. But I think the worst of those rises are behind us. And I think that's going to bring people back as economic confidence grows. They'll come back to the smaller company space where everybody's run away because they're scared. You know, at the moment, all investors are very sort of huddled, if you like, in one space. You know, even if you take the US, 40% of retail investment money is in three stocks, NVIDIA, Tesla, and Apple. Okay, everyone is in one little crowded space. Uh, and I'll try and outline a bit why this space could be interesting. The other thing is just, as I say, of European smaller companies and the MSCI is the index, okay? Um, and we're hovering just above 11 times for the index. I'll come back to it. This fund is actually trading a little bit below that in terms of price to earnings multiple. Now, I don't know, the future may be different, but historically, if you look back at the sort of three year returns that you've got, if you can get into this small cap space, 11 times earnings, they're pretty exciting. It's very difficult to time these things to perfection, but over time, this is looking like a pretty good entry point. Similarly, sort of pushing the valuation argument, you know, small cap did trade at a premium because of the far superior growth, okay, that you see in small cap and large cap. You know, if we, if we go back to, you know, I'm exaggerating the point, we go back to 1990, 
nearly 80% of those years, small cap has seen greater growth than large cap. And I think that is what will happen if they'll return. As I say, I think the last three years are an anomaly. But small cap is trading at a discount to large cap. And it's also trading at a massive discount to US large cap, which goes back to my point about everybody be just in two or three tech companies. Okay. One thing maybe to point out about Europe and smaller companies is if you if you buy into this space, you're buying into that whole sustainability. You're buying into that move towards the electrification of society. You know, that is the direction of travel. There'll be blips along the way, like you're seeing in, say, offshore wind in the US at the moment, or maybe even in the North Sea. But that's the direction of travel. And there are companies like Mans in Germany, tiny companies that nobody really covers, making equipment to make lithium ion batteries. Initially, these orders have been won by the Chinese, but the Chinese are failing to deliver. And you're starting to see some of the big German OEMs look at more local sort of equipment manufacturers. Okay, so this is a good play. This fund or any other fund, to be frank, in the European small cap space, you will be getting an exposure to that sustainability thing. Another thing that, you know, should help the consumer as we move into the end of this year and into next is that after the wage increases we've seen across Europe of sort of six, seven percent, and with inflation coming down, we're going to see real wage growth for the first time for a long time. Again, so that the sort of dire consumer environment that we have had in the last year or so, and it's been tough for consumers across Europe, should start to improve. Going back to my point about, okay, the focus within uh, investors in a few stocks. Um, if we take just one theme, artificial intelligence, there are companies in our sort of remit, which are looking really cheap and benefiting today, which the market is ignoring. You know, the, the stock market is buying into large cap semiconductor companies in the hope that they will get orders from the likes of TSMC and Samsung to try and deliver this memory, this high bandwidth memory that is required for artificial intelligence. But they're not winning orders today. There are companies in our area, like Seuss Microtech, who sells uh, semiconductor equipment, or Munters, who provides the cooling for data centers, or also who sort of resell Microsoft software, they are benefiting today from these themes, and they are trading a fraction of the valuation. And it all comes back to everyone's been scared about the economy, and everyone's run away from European smaller companies, and hence the discount on trust like this you know, 15%. That, I think, genuinely is an opportunity today. Um, you know, and, and I should also say, that, you know, that goes into other areas of the economy. You know, everyone's getting all very excited about uh, Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly on these obesity drugs and understandably why. There will be small cap companies that will benefit from that the companies that will make the rubber sort of seals for the syringes or whatever it is. There's ways of us playing it, which people aren't even looking at. Okay. So nice slide here. The, the, the team, the guys I work with directly, Rory, um, who I've worked with since 2013, and Julia Scheutler, who I've worked with since 2018. But it's a broader team. It's not worth me going through members of you know teams. It's just nice little names on a slide. There is no excuse. Janice Henderson. We have all the resources, we have all the support functionality. So if we don't know deliver the performance, you can probably come and blame me. Okay. That's probably all you need to know. As I say, that's a, uh, a slide showing the discount over time. And what it's showing here is that, you know, we're a pretty high discount at the moment. I should point out, and it's, you know, it's stated on the record, we have bought back a few shares in recent weeks because we think you know, our shares are pretty attractive. Um, there are other people maybe stepping into the market as well to try and play that discount. Uh, and hopefully that discount will narrow over time 
as Europe comes back into favour, which I guess is as the people get more confident about the economy, and as European smaller companies come back into favour. And then clearly it's our job to try and deliver the performance, to try and make us an attractive fund, and therefore hopefully we will see that discount narrow. You know, we've done many other things. We changed the name in recent years. We've been lost marketing. We, the board kindly lowered the fees. So, I mean, it's all in place, hopefully, to try and make this an attractive fund to invest in a trust. Um, I'm not going to go through our investment process in detail this evening. Just one thing maybe I'll point out. The way we're trying to work is we're trying to sort of look in a different direction. We're trying to give you a list of stocks that you may not be familiar with, okay? Um, by looking somewhere else, we can hopefully find very attractive companies at good valuation. We are trying to buy undervalued companies where the perception of the market is wrong. That's what we're trying to do in its simplest form, okay? The performance, well, Probably, I don't know which slide's easier. Maybe this, who knows, so many, there's so many different ways of showing performance. Look, the performance is okay. And the process we've had that's delivered that performance, nothing's really changed. You know, it's been myself as the lead manager on this trust for over 10 years and Rory's been there for, well, also 10 years now. So, okay, so we will continue doing what we're doing. We'll have the odd bad month, but hopefully over time, so if we focus on that process of buying undervalued companies, keep searching around in that universe of two and a half thousand companies, we can deliver some good performance for, uh, for our in investors. Um, these are the top 10 holdings today. I'm not really going to go through them all, but, you know, TKH is a Dutch company doing things like making uh, the equipment to make tires, but also doing things like little cameras on production lines. Or something. You know, industrial tech company, Van Landshot is a Dutch wealth manager. Uh, the FDS, you probably know, Danish ferry company, KSB, a German pump manufacturer, Mertzen, they're making things like silicon carbide. More and more uh, semiconductors are moving to the more higher power of silicon carbide away from silicon, and they're one of two or three producers of the world. And then things like GTT, they are a um, they license technology to allow vessels to carry LNG. Obviously, saw a big pickup in LNG, particularly after the Russian invasion. And then in Mytilineos is a Greek aluminium producer and uh, energy utility shifting to renewables. So just some examples. It's very diverse. Um, you know, it's across a number of sectors. The one advantage I'd say of say maybe continental Europe over the UK Look, UK smaller companies does look good value. I would argue with that. This is going to give you a much more diverse economic exposure. Europe is quite a narrow economy, but a service-led economy. And in the investment area arena in the UK is again even narrower. You can get exposure. If you look at our sector weightings, we have some cyclical exposure. Why? Because we think valuations in some of these cyclical spaces like industrials and house builders are looking very interesting for the medium term. Real estate, and healthcare, we found less exciting ideas, but it purely comes to valuation. Okay, Real estate is obviously one of the big winners of leverage and free money, and a lot of these companies now need to raise money. But even there, we find exciting areas, maybe like student housing and logistics. Okay. Um, geographically, we don't care that much, okay? That is what it is. This is bottom up, okay? And valuations. And maybe finally, just some sort of data points on the on the portfolio. Uh, hopefully this makes some sense to you guys. I'm trying to explain it a little bit. The dividend yield on the portfolio is relatively high. Why? Because we've got companies that are generating cash. The price earnings multiple in the fund is lower than the market. It is considerably lower, for better or worse, than my peers. Return on equity is a sort of measure in some ways of the quality of a company. So that's higher than the market. So we're paying less for hopefully higher quality companies. The historical earnings growth has been greater than the market. Forecast, we're predicted to do slightly less. Well, let's see. 
these things, those forecasts are rarely right. In fact, the certainty is they're wrong. Um, and then the net debt to EBITDA, the amount of borrowing um, within on within the holdings within the portfolio is less than the market. Now, maybe we should start to look at some taking on some companies with leverage, uh, you know, as interest rates peak. Okay, um, I'm probably going to stop there. Look, this, there's an exciting opportunity within European smaller companies. Um, you know, we could invest in companies with looking at, I don't know, podcasts or, as I say, areas that are exposed to AI, you know, across the board. Um, there's exciting opportunities. The valuations at the moment are really attractive. So if you don't think we're heading for a really hard landing and a really bad recession, um, this is a pretty good place to be, I think. It is geared to global growth. Um, but as I say, I think this is an attractive entry point for anyone looking to willing to invest in the medium term. So I'm going to stop there and uh, I'll happily uh, sort of take any questions. I'll stop sharing this presentation. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, that was good to run through and gives us a good amount of time for questions as well. So that's excellent. Um, uh, Guy Jackson's just asking, um, can you expand on the ways in which China is failing to deliver? Okay. Um, well, sl slightly out, out off the, uh, <laughs> I think oh, you no, mentioned that as part of the reason that there's uh, a lot more um, uh, investment into European capacity to replace that. So maybe uh, it's wow. relevant. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously all sorts of things going on with China, and I'm not sure I'm, in many ways I'm the best person to comment because um, I'm sitting here in London and I look at European investments. I'll say a couple of things. There's obviously been issues in the real estate market within China. There is, from what I'm seeing, and I'll be looking at a lot of the same stuff as you guys, I'm not seeing obvious signs of contagion. And the only other thing I would say is we have done meetings in recent weeks of companies who are saying, hey, things are getting better. Um, now, clearly, post-COVID and them coming out of COVID, that recovery was not what people hoped for. Okay. Uh, and that led to some of the disappointment. That's led to some of the disappointment within Europe. And, and I'm pointing out why does it matter for Europe? Because it does. Is that Europe, unlike the US or unlike China, is more dependent on that global economy. If you think that German middle stand, they're exporting to the US, but they're also exporting to China. Now, there is another sort of story, if you like, around should European and Western companies be allowed to sell to China? Now, I don't want to, I'm not going to deny there are some issues around companies seeing delays and things like export licenses to sell equipment to China. But ultimately, rightly or wrongly, most European companies are still being allowed to sell their, you know, industrial equipment to China. So right. any stabilization in that economy is a positive. Um, and as I say, at a micro level in the companies we're speaking to, things seem to be getting better. Now, I'm not sure I've really answered the question, but I'm trying to answer the question from a European smaller company's perspective. Sure. Okay. No, thank you. Um, I was just thinking, actually, uh, uh, when when you when you're making your decisions, to what degree have you ramped up uh, the the um, exposure to China factor in your decision making? Not really at all. I mean, no. I mean, we're, look, we're, that's not really how we work. I've not. I'm not playing theme. I'm not going to buy anything for themes. We're not going to shift anything to the economy on a top-down basis. Ultimately, if you were to look at the um, sort of attribution of this fund and what drives performance, it's very much individual bottom-up stock selection. Now, for individual stocks, I mentioned to you Seuss Microtech, which is a small, small German semiconductor equipment company, benefiting at the moment from AI and orders from TSMC, which is also Taiwan. They sell to China. So if they can't, that would be an impact. And I want to know what's going on with regards to export us. Mm. But it's very mm. much bottom-up driven. I'm not making macro calls. It's not a macro fund. It's not a thematic fund. Mm. And throughout, the valuation must be right. Okay. Yeah, understood. Uh, William wants to know what the 
portfolio turnover is? I don't have the precise figure for you, but today, this year, I think year to date, we're about 40%. 40. The okay. turnover, the, the weightings of holdings, I changed quite a lot as we sort of may make money or lose money and then top up on holdings. The names don't change that much. So if you were to look at the top 10 holdings, most of them have been there for like five, 10 years. Right. Just so as what... a caveat, COVID, the turnover did pick up during COVID. We needed to shift the economy and get rid of anything that had any sort of too much borrowing and leverage and might not get through COVID. Mm -hmm. We did that pretty instantly. But that was the, that's the only time it's really picked up. Okay, well, it, while we're on the topic there of leverage, then I got a question came in here about that, I think. Oh, where has it gone? Oh, I think you mentioned it actually in one of your slides. You said the average gearing was about 1.5 in your portfolio, if I recall, or something along those lines. Have you uh, changed your uh, profile on that in terms of where you're going with it over the next few years? If you're thinking about interest rates being up at the sort of 4 5% level for the foreseeable future, have you... Are you are you are you uh, increase or should I say decreasing the uh, the level of gearing in your portfolio? No. Well, well, from here, okay. So we did decrease it. Yes, but are you going to continue during... with that, or do you think you're at the right kind of level now for going forward? No, I, I think you will actually start to see a selectively increase it. Why? Mm. I mean, understandably through this year you have wanted to avoid and we have tried to avoid companies with a lot of borrowing because most companies have uh, variable debt and they've taken the pay but what we're starting to see is that uh, a lot of those companies are priced for a really poor outcome as if while well, they need to raise equity and if that starts to get priced in they start to be interesting mm. the other thing we will do is as companies raise equity, or as they less likely manage to refinance their debt successfully, we will start to look at a number of these holdings. So as they repair their balance sheet, it's going to be an opportunity. So real estate selectively might become more interesting. It's been hit very hard. The companies are way too leveraged. They all seem to assume that free money would last forever. Mm -hmm. um, but selectively, as I say, things like student housing or logistics in continental Europe, not dominated by Amazon, unlike the UK, will be interesting. So I actually think you might start to see us take on some companies with some leverage. Okay. And you mentioned that you're planning for uh, an avoidance of a, a recession in, in Europe at the moment. Um, but what's your downside scenario and how are you managing that risk? Well, we I mean, in some ways a lot of as I say, if I go back to the spec the you know MSCI European small companies, we're trading at just over eleven times earnings. That's almost a recession level. Okay, so we're and if you were to look at industrials within European smaller companies, they're trading at big discounts to their larger peers. Hmm. So that fear of a recession is pretty much priced in. Now we. You know, countries can selectively have that one, two quarters of negative growth, and therefore you could say technically are in a recession. Um, but I think from here, when I say hard landing, I mean, are we really going to see mass unemployment of eight, nine, ten percent? Can't mm -hmm. see it. I don't see it. And that's what we've started to factor in. Now, in the last 10 days or so, as people have thought interest rates you know, the central banks are probably done with raising rates. Mm. I'm not saying they're going to come down in a hurry. People are going to have to learn to live with rates of 3 4%, and they will. Then this is looking pretty attractive. Mm. Okay. Um, Stefan was asking, uh, you talked about the higher oil price having a negative impact on the performance of small caps. Does the fund have positions in small cap EMP, such as in Norway, uh, providing some exposure to oil prices as a sort of a hedge? Not directly, no. So when I say underperformed, I mean underperformed relative to larger companies. So mm -hmm. the only reason, I mean, I'm almost saying the reason large cap is outperformed in the last few years is because of a higher oil price and because of inflation and the indices within large cap 
are heavy on oil and they're heavy on financials. Now, my space isn't heavy on you know banks and uh, there are some banks, regional banks, but but it's not heavy on sort of large oil producers. We right. are not going to play in oil exploration. I haven't got a clue. So to have an edge there, I'm probably quite frankly going to have to hang out in the bars of Oslo <laughs> and see who's buying and see who's buying the drinks. Right. Because otherwise, that's just for me, it's a bit of a mugs game. Um, there are other ways of playing how our energy costs through LNG, um, maybe through some of the renewables. There is going to be a continual push on renewables. I mean, that's yeah, there are going to be blips along the way. As I say, the costs have got too high and say wind turbine, offshore wind. We've got some exposure to onshore wind. It's starting to pick up. Um, so it's going to be more through, I'd say, the sort of renewables, those new industries, because small cap is all about the new industries, if you like, rather than the history and the legacy, then I, I think that's where we're going to see more opportunity. Okay, thank you. In fact, Guy's asked a similar question to the one I asked earlier, which is the defl deflation, i.e. negative inflation, might be unlikely, but if it does occur, how worried would you be? I think you've pretty much covered that with your discussion there that, uh, about what you're doing to manage your attitude to that risk at the moment um, in terms of managing the portfolio. Did you want to add anything more, or is? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I guess the, the risk I would have maybe a, a European smaller companies will be fine if inflation comes down further. Now, maybe there will be funds out there which will be willing to pay higher multiples for stocks than we have that might do well if we go back to the old days of free money. Yeah, um, but that's we will. We have maintained a valuation discipline and we maintained a valuation discipline in sort of 19, 20, 21, 22. And we're going to keep doing that. Um, I don't I don't want to say that, you know, required rates of return should be one, two percent. I just don't believe it. So okay. that's not what we're going to do. OK, thank you. Uh, another one from Guy here. Is there a typical interval in years or months between making an investment and seeing it confirm or contradict your reasons for investing? How quickly would you exit in response to disappointing performance? Uh, it varies, is the truth, but I think you, you probably need. So if it was a turnaround case, I think you're going to have to give that management team probably nine months to still see are the sales improving, are the margins improving, are the returns improving. But there are other, say, warning signs if, you know, if there is a deterioration in balance sheet or if, um, if there's a change of narrative from the management, i.e., the you know, one month they're telling us one thing, the other next month they're talking about something completely differently. Well, then we might act a little bit quicker. Yeah. Uh, and occasionally, new information comes to light. You know, CEOs taking out loans against their stock. Well, if they do that, I'm running. So, mm -hmm. but normally, in a normal environment, I think if certainly in those turnaround cases, we're going to give them nine nine months probably as a, on average right okay thank you um just I, I observed when you went through the team i didn't spot a lot of what you call european names in the team quite it seemed to be a quite a british flavor is that uh are all your team based in the uk or do you have team members based in country in uh, in the continent no they're all based here uh Actually, contrary, there are, there's quite a few Europeans on the European team. So oh, well. <laughs> um, uh, I, I could bring the names back up, but I won't bother. So on our immediate team, oh, okay, you're right. There's myself and Rory Stokes. Rory would claim to be Scottish, but he's a sort of plastic jock, if you like. He probably grew up in the home counties. Um, Julia is Austrian. Julia oh, right. Schreifler. So yep. But then even on the, the wider European team, we have Federico. Guess what? He's Italian. Okay. Uh, we have Mark Sharks, who's from Luxembourg, Robert Schramm, who is German, Tom Lemegra, who is Belgian. Uh, so there's, and I've probably missed a couple. So there's, yeah, there's a good we've spread. Got, yeah, yeah, we've got a few languages and a few Europeans on board. Okay, I stand corrected because I think it's always useful to have somebody who's a local and speaks the lingo and so on when you're talking to these companies, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, very much so. Uh, the the uh, your discount it seems to be uh, a lot higher than your peer group at the moment. And what do you think is driving that? Um, some pay a dividend out of capital, which we don't do. Uh, 
personally, I don't really believe in that. I'm not sure it's the right message. Um, you know, this isn't as volatile as people think, the European smaller company space, but it, there's a bit of volatility, and I don't think, therefore, you should be paying a dividend out of capital. I don't want to give the impression that this is some sort of guilt or something. It's not. Um, so some do that. People buy into that. Um, I think also because Europe is out of favour and European smaller companies is a little bit out of favour. Maybe we, we need to, we're trying. Maybe we need to do more to enhance the brand, um, get the message out there. Um, we've delivered pretty decent performance. We need to get that message out there. Okay, so there's more for us to do, I guess. Um, right, right. We're going to, yeah. and the board, the board are determined to try and get this discount down, and they are trying everything in the book to try and do so. But you know, you're not going to dip into capital in order to do that it will always it will always come from existing income yeah we're not going to pay a dividend out of capital i mean we bought a few shares back recently but i'm hopeful that sentiment will change and that discount will narrow as it's done hist history would tell me that that sentiment changes you know it's not that long ago we briefly traded at a premium now that seems a long time ago yeah actually, uh, these things can change I don't. I don't know whether some of it could be to do with the gearing level you've got, which again is, is or uh, certainly the last figures I looked at is uh, is is a fair bit higher than the peer group. Um, what's your what's your cost of borrowing on average at the moment then? Uh, so we've, I've got to go back. We're paying, I think, two percent over a year of all, if I remember rightly. Um, so it's 2%. there, but it's to be honest, it isn't going to matter. That's all going to be negative. It's, it's going to get lost in the wash vis-a-vis -vis the returns we deliver on these stocks, if you look at the numbers over time. Um, and the gearing is high at the moment because it's pretty positive. If I mm. look at the opportunity, if I look at the quality of the companies that I can buy today on the valuations, which are really attractive, I think you know gearing is a vehicle that you have in the investment trust. And I Hopefully, well, I may be proven incorrect, but I think now is a decent time to use it. I would add that you know we're structurally slightly geared, but at the moment we're we're pretty positive. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, insolvencies in European small caps, I mean we've heard stories about what's going on in the UK market at the moment, and insolvencies are certainly creeping up in smaller companies. Oh, well, more than creeping up at the moment. What what's happening yeah. in continental Europe? Uh, there have been some, but. Not meant. I mean, there are insolvencies going on. I mean, we're talking smaller companies, but often I'm talking, you know, companies with a few hundred million of sales. Really, the, the insolvencies are probably happening more on the high street, it's hairdressers, it's restaurants. It, it's sort of ha the, the sort of wide scale insolvencies you see mm. Mm. are on a level, you know, below this in the unlisted community. Okay. So it's not yeah. something we're being impacted on. Not hopefully, it stays, hopefully it stays that way. Okay. Uh, what, one that uh, our patron, Lord Lee, would be uh, fond of asking you if he were on the webinar today would be, because um, uh, he's always saying to, to me that he, he looks at small caps that have a still have a family um, involvement and a significant share uh, yeah. is held by families. Um, he likes to see that because they've got skin in the game. They've got the... The heritage yeah. uh they've got the the their hearts in the right place is that something you look at in your portfolio when you're going looking at investment opportunities yeah i mean it is um and what the drivers are there's obviously foundation structures i mean that's something you see way more in continental europe than you will do in the uk for example right there are, you know we're exposed to, we have new I, I don't know the number but we have probably 20, 30 family-orientated companies or foundation-led companies in the portfolio. Right. Now, now, there's good and bad about that. I mean, they tend to be more conservative because the one thing you see in continental Europe, which again isn't the case in the UK, these smaller companies have less debt than their larger counterparts. Mm -hmm. And more of, them, more of them run on net cash. So they're quite conservatively run, which makes sense. If you've got a family company, you don't want to be the generation that screws it up and loses the family company. Yeah. Now, the good thing is, clearly, um, they're pretty driven. 
they're pretty driven to uh, see returns. They're not they're not some management on a three year option plan, do the best they can and then shift off to the next great job, which mm -hmm. arguably happens in a more Anglo Saxon world and there's a much more greater turnover of management. Right. Fill your L, you know, fill your boots on your L tip and off you go. Right. Uh, so we hence why we've had a lot of these companies for a long time and they've delivered growth for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks for that, Ollie. Um, right. We seem to be all out of questions. I think I've covered all the ones that we got submitted before. Um, uh, just a quick, uh, you know, shout to anybody out there if they've got a, another question they're desperate to ask. Now is the moment. Right. Guy again says, what is your view on luxury goods? Are they immune to economic downturn? Okay. I can imagine where that one's coming from. Uh, no, I don't think they're immune. Um, we don't have much exposure. I'm trying to think we don't have any exposure, but that's, uh, that's more by chance than anything, but I, I'm not really going to comment on LVMH, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm quite often put off by uh, valuations in that space, but that we're, we're not really playing in that area at the moment, just that's from our perspective. Right. Okay. No, thank you for that then, Ollie. Okay. We're, uh, we're out of questions. So, um, uh, oh, I think I just saw another one pop in actually. Oh, thanks for all your answers. No, it's uh, not a question. It's a statement from Guy. He's very pleased with uh, your answers. So there you go. You've got one happy customer there. Um, so thanks very much, Ollie. Appreciate that. That was a good run through and, uh, interesting guy. Uh, I think we're, uh, we had a, we had a, a JP Morgan large European cap, uh, uh, presentation about three, two, three weeks ago, and some of the some of the similar themes are coming through there. But there are clearly some distinct differences when you get into the small cap market. So it was uh, very useful because it's an area that I personally want to increase my weighting in in the next few months because I do see a little bit like you that there's opportunities there. So so useful for me and hopefully for everybody else online today. Um, well, um, we'll love you and leave you and hopefully get you back sometime in the future to update us on what's happening in Europe, because it's uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big market. And uh, I, I personally like to keep a, a good share of my portfolio in the European market. So thanks very much, Ollie, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. No, well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. Bye, -bye. Bye for now.